Tonight, the whistleblower speaks. Even if you're not doing anything wrong, you're being watched and recorded. The man who leaked details of the National Security Agency's massive cell phone surveillance program has gone public, and Jan Crawford reports. First-hand account. As a sixth person dies today, a woman who survived the Santa Monica shooter speaks with Carter Evans. I knew that I wasn't a human being to him in any way. Extreme heat. The southwest again bakes under temperatures over 100 degrees. Don Daler has the story. And empty seat. After a fourth grader who spent most of his life in America is deported, John Blackstone says his classmates are asking why. This is the CBS Evening News. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jeff Glor. We now know his name, age, and reason. He is 29-year-old Edward Snowden, the man behind what's been called the biggest intelligence leak in the history of the National Security Agency. Snowden says he did it, in his words, because the U.S. government is, quote, destroying privacy and basic liberties around the world. Jan Crawford in Washington has more. My name is Ed Snowden. I'm uh, 29 years old. I work for Booz Allen Hamilton as an infrastructure analyst for NSA uh, in Hawaii. The Guardian released the interview Sunday afternoon, revealing Snowden's identity at his request. A former CIA technician who grew up in North Carolina and Maryland, Snowden says he decided to leak classified information because of concerns about the NSA's top secret surveillance programs. I, sitting at my desk, uh, certainly had the authorities to, to wiretap anyone from you or your accountant to a federal judge to even the president if I had a personal email. In the interview, Snowden told The Guardian's Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras he believes the NSA's once targeted data collection programs have become too broad. You don't have to have done anything wrong. You simply have to eventually fall under suspicion from somebody, even by a wrong call, and then they can use the system to go back in time and scrutinize every decision you've ever made. Also today, the Washington Post released its own interview with Snowden, revealing him as the paper's main source for its stories detailing NSA surveillance. According to The Guardian, Snowden was working in Hawaii for government contractor Booz Allen Hamilton as an NSA systems administrator. Three weeks ago, after copying one last set of documents, he told his supervisors he needed to leave work for a couple weeks to recover from epilepsy, a condition he said he was diagnosed with last year. He said goodbye to his girlfriend and flew to Hong Kong, where he has remained and where The Guardian interviewed him on camera. He said he came forward so the public could assess his motives. I'm just another guy who sits there day to day in the office, watches what happening, what's happening, and goes, this is something that's not our place to decide. The public needs to decide whether these programs and policies are right or wrong. And I'm willing to go on the record to defend the authenticity of them. Snowden says he knows and his disclosures have that, put him at risk. You, you can't come forward against the world's most powerful intelligence agencies and uh, be completely free from risk because they're such powerful adversaries that, that no one can meaningfully oppose them. Um, if they want to get you, they'll get you in time. Now, Snowden told uh, The Guardian that he's hoping to get asylum in a country he says values privacy, perhaps somewhere like Iceland. And just a while ago, Booz Allen, the firm where he was working, released a statement saying he'd been there less than three months. Jeff, it said it was shocked and wor would work closely with authorities in the investigation of the leaks. All right, Jan Crawford, thank you. We are joined now by our senior national security analyst, Juan Zarate, who is also in Washington. Uh, Juan Snowden says, and I quote, if I wanted to see your emails or your wife's phone, all I have to use is intercepts. I can get your emails, passwords, phone records, and credit cards. First of all, is that possible? And second of all, if it is, how does an outside contractor get that kind of inside information? Jeff, it strikes me that he may be overstating his access and what he, he was doing or could do. Uh, but there's no question that the National Security Agency, the U.S. government, has access to lots of information, and these leaks have revealed the big data that it has access to. Um, but it also has checks on what can be done with that information, and the National Security Agency and other intelligence community agencies spend a lot of money to make sure that analysts and others who have access to it are not doing things that are illegal or improper. 
One more quote from Snowden. If I just wanted to harm the U.S., you could shut down the surveillance system in an afternoon. Your reaction when you hear that? Well, again, I think he's aggrandizing himself a bit, but I think it's true that if you have somebody who has access to this kind of information and they decide to go rogue, they can put lots of people at risk and certainly expose very important programs to the United States. The Guardian says these leaks are comparable to Daniel Ellsberg and the Pentagon Papers and Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. Put it in context for us, what we know right now. How significant is the breach? Well, we know the breach is significant because these are important counterterrorism programs to the intelligence community. But that comparison, I think, would be more apt if we were finding out that the programs were being used for illegal purposes or for some grand uh, scheme outside the bounds of the law. But I think this would look much more like the revelations in 2006 of the terrorist financing tracking program, which was found to be legal and effective. Juan Zarate, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. We learned today a woman who was shot by the Santa Monica gunman on Friday has died. She's identified as 26-year-old Marcella Franco. She was a passenger in an SUV driven by her father, Carlos Franco, who died when his vehicle crashed after being fired upon. The death toll has now risen to six, including the gunman who was shot and killed by police. CBS News has confirmed the gunman's identity as former Santa Monica College student John Zawari. Today, a survivor of the attacks talked to CBS News, and here's Carter Evans. When this Santa Monica home burst into flames on Friday, 23-year-old John Zawari had already killed two of his family members inside. He was dressed in black fatigues, armed with multiple weapons and 1,300 rounds of ammunition. Is that a bullet hole right there? Yes, it is. Deborah Fine was his third shooting victim. She was driving home from a singing lesson and took a different route to avoid traffic from the president's visit. It was like the perfect storm. I saw a man with a Kevlar vest, looking very much like a SWAT team member. And you thought he could be a police officer. I absolutely thought it had something to do with the fact that Obama was in town. Then she saw the gunman near the intersection of Yorkshire and Kansas pull over a woman in a car. When he absolutely aimed at her and the rifle came up, I knew that that wasn't anything somebody from the police would do. Fine was just 20 feet away from Zawari. She saw cold determination in his eyes. He was absolutely on a mission. Everything had been planned out. He was then just in execute mode. You could tell that just by looking at it? Absolutely. It was execute mode. And then you realized that he was turning his attention to you? Yes, I did. Very fast. Um, and then I saw his eyes, I saw him point, and I then I knew. Then I knew that he was really going to shoot. And when I heard the explosion um, and the glass flying and I felt something throw me to the side, I knew it was a bullet. Fine was shot four times. A witness took video as a neighbor rushed to her side. Her voice was shaky but very strong. She just took charge and asked for people to get her um, towels. She held me very close. Did you think you might die? I never thought I was going to die. And now, knowing that he was on a rampage and knowing who he is, uh, now I'm terrified. Deborah Fine still has bullet fragments inside her body. She is expected to make a full physical recovery, but just she tells me she's just beginning to come to terms with the emotional aspect of this shooting. Carter Evans, thank you very much. A bipartisan Senate bill to overhaul the U.S. immigration system now has the support of a key Republican. Senator Kelly Ayotte of New Hampshire announced her support for the bill this morning on Face the Nation. She told Bob Schieffer the bill is tough and fair. Our immigration system is completely broken. We've got 11 million people living in this country illegally, in the shadows. We have a legal immigration system that isn't meeting our needs to grow our economy. And so I looked at this careful. This is a thoughtful bipartisan solution to a tough problem, and so that's why I'm going to support it. Lawmakers are also looking to overhaul the way the U.S. military handles sexual assaults. The Pentagon says there are 26,000 sexual assaults in the military each year. More than half the victims are men. Britain and Israel use prosecutors, not commanders, to handle their cases. And New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand said on Face the Nation as well, that model could work here. So that decision will be made in a more objective way, which we hope will instill more confidence 
by the victim in the system that he or she has a chance to receive justice. And just to be clear, this is not just a woman's issue. More than half of the victims are men. This is a problem that is corrosive, that's undermining the integrity of the whole military and is undermining our military readiness. Overseas, Turkey's prime minister said today his country's financial markets are under attack. Recep Tayyip Erdogan blamed speculators as he reacted to a 10th day of nationwide protests against his government. Holly Williams is in Istanbul. In the Turkish capital, Ankara today, protesters again clashed with the police. The authorities have used tactics that many here criticize as heavy-handed. But at other times, the demonstrations have looked like a carnival. They began in Istanbul over the planned destruction of a city park to build a shopping mall. The crowds have occupied the park and are in a victorious mood. Many here now say they've taken to the streets to safeguard Turkey's democracy. They believe the country's Prime Minister, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, is behaving like a dictator, trying to impose his own more conservative Islamic views on the country. Those fears were flamed when Erdogan's government recently moved to restrict the sale of alcohol. The freedom to drink has become a theme of the protests. Anger with the Prime Minister has unified Turks who normally can't see eye to eye, including these soccer fans from rival teams. They're calling for Erdogan to resign. Now it's about our country, our, our uh, freedom. So now we are all together. Democratically elected three times, the Prime Minister is still popular with many Turks and he's vowed to teach the protesters a lesson in elections next year. Speaking to a crowd of thousands of supporters today, Erdogan said he'd be patient with those demonstrating against him, but that his patience has limits. Holly Williams, CBS News, Istanbul. It's been an anxious weekend in South Africa, where former President Nelson Mandela remains hospitalized for a lung infection. Mark Phillips is standing by in Pretoria this evening. Mark, what are the further indications we're getting that his condition is more serious this time? Well, the first indication, of course, is that this is the third night that he'll be in this hospital. The other is that the wording that the government is using to describe his condition, they're calling it serious but stable. And we know that he's here for a lung infection. We know that he's had this problem before and been hospitalized several times for that as well. But this time there does seem to be a sense that people here and really around the world are being prepared for at least the possibility of the inevitable. We hear serious but stable, Mark. Have we gotten any sort of encouraging words beyond that from the government? No, not encouraging words, uh, and in fact the absence of them is what has some people concerned. In his previous hospital visits here, the government would put out statements that at least had some hope uh, in them. They would talk about him responding uh, to the treatment that he's getting and that kind of thing. His wife, uh, Grasa Michal, who came uh, here with him in the early hours of Saturday morning here, stays with him in the hospital. We know that other members of his family have come to see him as well, grandchildren. Previously on these sorts of uh, hospitalizations, they've waited a few days for him to respond to treatment before showing up. Now they're coming uh, earlier in this day, which is a worrying sign as well. Mark Phillips in Pretoria. Thank you. Later, fourth graders fighting to win the return of a deported classmate. Record floodwaters across the heart of Europe. And a heat wave threatens much of the southwest. Those stories when the CBS Evening News continues. Extreme heat is baking much of the southwest this weekend. A 69-year-old hiker died yesterday near Hoover Dam. Other people have been hospitalized. And wildfire fears are on the rise. Don Daler has more. It was 100 degrees in Fresno, California, Friday evening. The parents of a 15-month-old boy accidentally left him in their car when they took in the groceries. They began frantically searching all over the house. Uh, Ford, I thought you had him. one of those things. I thought you were, no, and they went out to the vehicle and checked, and that's where they found the, the baby. The child was dead. <laughs> Sixteen people attending an outdoor graduation ceremony in Brentwood, California on Saturday were treated for heat-related illnesses. Many had fainted as temperatures reached triple digits for the third straight day. 
uh, a lot of them were feeling faint, um, a lot of them were dizzy, um, and felt overwhelmed um, from sitting out in the sun to watch the graduation. Much of the U.S. is experiencing an early summer. It's very early in the season to see such tremendous heat in the deep southwest. Typically, we'd see this more during the month of July. We're about 15 degrees above normal for this time of year. The Interior Department says this will be an above normal wildfire season. They've already cropped up in New Mexico and California, where 1,200 fires have charred 40,000 acres. That's twice as many fires as usual this time of year and 30 times as many burned acres. And the U.S. isn't alone in this. In Great Britain, the temperatures have reached nearly 90 degrees, while in India, last week over 500 people died of heat stroke because of a heat wave there. Jeff. Don Daler, thank you. Central Europe is bracing for record flooding after a week of heavy rain. Thousands have been evacuated in Hungary as the Danube overflows its banks. The river is expected to crest tomorrow. So volunteers and soldiers stack sandbags to bolster flood walls today. At least 21 deaths are blamed on the floods. It took something a little stronger than flares to bring down an 11-story New York City apartment building. A look at this. A series of controlled explosions turned the former Coast Guard housing complex on Governor's Island into a pile of rubble. That site is being turned into a park. Still ahead here tonight, inside the immigration debate, a group of fourth graders speak up to bring a deported classmate back. Finally tonight, no matter how you feel about the immigration debate in America, there is no debate about how significantly current policies can affect some of the youngest members of society. Tonight, John Blackstone has a case in point, a group of fourth graders who are rallying not for a cause, but for a friend. There has been an empty seat for months now in the fourth grade classroom at Jefferson Elementary in Berkeley, California. Ten-year-old Rodrigo Guzman isn't there. How long have you known Rodrigo? Since kindergarten. His classmates, Amina Diaby and Kaya Daniels, miss him. He's really smart and he has a lot of friends. Rodrigo was just 16 months old when family came to the U.S. on a tourist visa. To him, this has always been home. He came into the fourth grade already reading at a fifth grade level. Teacher Barbara Wenger was first to learn that Rodrigo and his family had been deported. Their visas had expired. They are barred from the U.S. for at least five years. Sharing news with a 10-year-old that their classmate couldn't be here because of where he was born it doesn't make sense. Did you understand what was happening? No. Did you understand why? No. Rodrigo's absence was just as baffling for twins Kyle and Scott Kuahara. I wasn't really familiar with like immigration laws and Congress people and stuff like that. It shouldn't take five years to apply for a new visa because that's a long time to be away from your friends and family. You decided something should be done about this? Yes. What they did was take the case of their friend to the Berkeley City Council, to the streets, and to the White House. Dear President Obama, please bring Rodrigo home. The students' activism shouldn't be surprising, perhaps, in a class where they've been studying civil rights leaders. The message is, you don't just stand back, you try to do something about it. They all stood up for their rights and for what they believed in, so now we're trying to stand up for Rodrigo's rights. This summer, several of the fourth graders hope to visit Washington to personally lobby for Rodrigo's return. Scott has a message for his classmate still in Mexico. You shouldn't give up hope because your friends are uh, here to support you. As America debates immigration reform, there is a class full of fourth graders ready to testify that no matter how Rodrigo Guzman got here, he belongs here. John Blackstone, CBS News, Berkeley, California. That is the CBS Evening News tonight, later on CBS 60 Minutes. I'm Jeff Glor, CBS News in New York. Scott Pelley will be here tomorrow. Good night. It is the Vatican's highest honor. Find out what Pope Benedict did to make this magnificent basilica sacred. 60 Minutes, tonight. On television, online, on the go, and now free on iPad.
CBS News.